Hi, welcome to Instrumental Analysis. I'm Vicki Colvin. We're in week five in lecture six. And what we're going to be doing in this mini lecture is talking about the columns in gas chromatography systems. The choice of column is incredibly important. It's perhaps one of the biggest decisions you make as a chromatographer because you have to load it into your system and then you'll use it for maybe a day or two depending on the analysis. So thinking through how to select the column and what the issues are is a big part of what I want to teach you. So one thing to realize about GC columns is that really cheap ones that you might find, let's say, at a university that has an undergraduate lab and, and just needs to get a lot of work done are probably going to be packed bed columns. So they'll either have really nicely shaped silica particles, like little beads that sort of pack a thin column, or literally they might be packed with dirt, better known as diatomaceous matter. And that's what's shown over here. What these basically are are just porous columns in which the stationary phase is loaded onto the surfaces of these materials. And so as the gas flows through the column, it's interacting with a high surface area of liquid that helps the chromatography separation happen. The reality is that these columns are pretty old school and that most of the GC you'll find today is done with a very different kind of column called a capillary column. So capillary columns can be extremely long, up to 30 meters, and that's going to give you really, really good resolution. If you remember, the number of plates actually goes proportionally with the length of the column. And they're going to be very, very thin. They're actually thin capillaries of glass. And the sizes are often well under a millimeter. And you put the stationary phase on the inner surface of the capillaries. And they really have a lot of advantages, particularly because they're not packed with a lot of stuff. You can don't have a lot of flow resistance to gases, so you can go at high flow rates. They also have the advantage, as we talked about earlier in these week's lectures, that they don't have multiple paths because they're an open tube. And of course, you can have very, very thin stationary phases, all of which point to really, really high resolutions for these capillary columns. Their real big disadvantage, besides the fact they're pretty expensive, is that they are easily overloaded. If you put too much material in, you're going to actually saturate that very, very small amount of stationary phase and really change your separation enormously. So if, for example, you're trying to use GC to measure an impurity in the background of a lot of other organic material, capillaries may not be the way for you to go. There's a couple of different terminologies and designs for capillary columns in terms of geometry. Over here on the left is kind of a typical perspective view of what's going on inside a capillary. So you're going to have, first off, it starts with glass. Glass that's been pulled into being a fiber that has a hole in the middle. And if that glass is fused silica, then the overall diameter can be much smaller. But what makes it strong and able to coil, like you saw before in that last example, is the fact that these are coated with a polyimide polymer that gives the very, very thin, fragile glass enough strength to survive the oven and the use that you might see in a typical GC operation. Now, that inner surface of the capillary is where the stationary phase is. And there's kind of two different options. Up here, you see a porous stationary phase, which would be a bunch of solid particles upon which a liquid is embedded. That's one example. And in that, you're not going to be able to use a really small diameter column, of course, but you're going to have a lot of capacity for interaction. So you have slightly higher what are called loading numbers. The bottom is a wall-coated open tube geometry. And in that case, it's just a thin layer of liquid coating the inner surface of a capillary tube. And so as you can see, gas chromatography is really gas liquid chromatography. You can have porous supports, as in the PLOT column, or you can just have a thin layer of liquid, as in the wall-coated geometry. And you may or may not bond that stationary phase to the glass. And that bonding would be a chemical bonding process that would allow these to operate at even higher temperatures. So this is a really great table just to sort of slowly take a look at, because it tells you a lot about the different column geometries. Just to go over, the FSOT is going to be the thinnest of the ones we talked about. That's a fused silica open tube geometry. So as you notice, the inner diameters are the smallest of all of the examples given. Then you have the wall coated and actually the porous coated open tube. And then finally, for reference, a conventional packed bed. So right away, you can see that a packed bed is going to have a diameter of 2 to 4 millimeters, which is far greater than any of the open tube geometries.
The other thing you're going to notice is that all of the open tube geometries beat the packed bed in terms of net column efficiency, both per length and look at the length difference. You can get up to 30 meters for the open tubes and really you might have six meters if you don't have an open tube. So you get both better efficiency per meter and a much longer number of meters and that's why you can really get high resolution with these capillary columns. You'll also see that you can operate at lower pressures and you can actually get a very good um, loading if you go with the wall coated or the porous system, but you'll notice in the FSOT, which is the smallest of all of them, that fused silica, really tiny capillary, the sample size in terms of how many nanograms you can get in really is getting small. And the real price of that, you can get tiny amounts of material into a column, but that puts a lot of stress on your detector because now your detector has to be able to see nanogram quantities of materials. And that's the other trade-off. So you might need the resolution. It means you're going to have to spend more to get a more sensitive detector. So let's talk a little bit about what goes on the inside of the column or the stationary phase of a GC system. Now, the stationary phase is an interesting choice, and what you see here in this table are some really classic kinds of materials that you'll find in a GC system. So a polydimethyl siloxane, the siloxane part is what bonds to the glass. So SIO, SIO framework is similar to the glass framework. So really what's presenting at the surface is the dimethyl functionalities on the backbone of that siloxane polymer. That's a classic nonpolar system and it goes to a particularly high temperature so you can run with even larger molecular weight less volatile materials so a polydimethyl siloxane is a really kind of go-to standard material to use for gas chromatography right down from it it's the same material but now you're putting some phenyls in so let's say you were trying to separate an aromatic from an alkane by putting phenyls in the column, you're going to increase the interactions of the aromatic. Those partitions will be a little bit higher, but you're not going to do much for the alkanes. So you can separate the retention times of those two analytes. You can put trifluorofluorine um, functionalities. That's going to be particularly good for heteroatoms. So if you have some chlorine-containing system or nitrogen, you'll actually have more interaction with the fluorinated systems. Finally, the most polar example is a PEG, or polyethylene glycol. That's actually pretty polar. There's a lot of oh, uh, alcohol functionalities, and that's kind of the most polar of the standard gas chromatography stationary phases. And finally, cyanopropyls, which again, the cyano group is kind of like the fluorine. It lets you interact better with, um, with heteroatoms and with um, pi orbitals. This is the classic siloxane backbone, and I'm just showing it to you because when you do the chemistry to create these stationary phases, you don't actually do it. You buy it from a company. But the siloxane backbone is the standard backbone. So you don't use conventional polymers, mainly because these kinds of um, polymers, they are a polymer of sorts, they're siloxane based, actually have very good thermal stability and they really don't react until you get to more than 350 C. So you change out that R functionality and that's how you derive either a more, for example, the dimethyl, which is going to be more nonpolar, or you can go all the way over to a cyano system, which will be better for heteroatoms. But this is the basic backbone of almost the, most of the conventional stationary phases used for GC. So I decided to look up some of these columns. These are actually from Agilent. And I was interested in illustrating a couple of things. One was how the retention times of different types of molecules changes on these columns. And I also wanted you to give you a glimpse of what a method starts to look like. So if you're going to read a GC method, what's the information that's provided about how the experiment was done? But let's start by talking about the columns themselves. So in these three examples, there are three capillary columns. And you know they're capillary columns because look at the dimensions. In all three cases, you have 30 meters long by 0.53 millimeters ID. That's a classic capillary column kind of dimension. You may not have a fused silica system because it's not the very smallest, the 0.1, but it's a pretty small inner diameter. The three microns is the thickness of the stationary phase you're working with. The other big difference between these, of course, is the chemistry. So the DB1 is the classic dimethyl siloxane. That's going to be the most polar system that you could have. And then DB wax is going to be, sorry, that's the most nonpolar system. And then DB wax is the most polar system. And DB624 is somewhere in the middle. It's got that cyano functionality. It's got some phenyl. So it's going to interact with molecules that have 
those kinds of species on them. So let's look at the retention times of a couple of different substances. So I've given sort of four examples here. But the first thing I want you to do is look at the retention times of dodecane as compared to ethanol. So dodecane is a classic nonpolar molecule. And as you can see, on both DB1 and DB624, it comes out very late. That means it's a lot like those phases. So that suggests that DB1 and DB624 are pretty nonpolar, which in fact is true. But when we go to DB wax, which is oddly named because it's more polar, uh, you see that it actually has a shorter retention time. That's because it's not interacting so much with that column. And you'll see a reverse with ethanol. Ethanol comes out fast on the nonpolars and more slow on the DB wax because the DB wax is more polar. And in fact, if you stare at this a while, you can see, you know, if you wanted to separate, let's say, ethanol and methanol, what would be your best choice? It turns out to separate ethanol and methanol, it's best to go with the most polar system because what you're really going to pick up is the difference that nonpolar tail on ethanol is actually going to make a bigger difference on the retention time than the other two columns. So you can look up tables of retention times. These are usually adjusted retention times uh, that are sort of corrected for flow rate and everything else. And many manufacturers provide that. So if you kind of know the molecules you're wishing to separate, doing some of the research into kind of choosing the right column that should give you the best chance is always a good idea. The other thing I want to focus on in this slide is, of course, the methodology that's in these little boxes. And I hope by now you're starting to become familiar with some of what you're reading. So, of course, the column, the DB1, they don't usually tell you the chemistry of the column. You have to go look that up in the manufacturer's literature. They'll give it some trade name. But it's always good if you're running a system to know what the underlying chemistry is in your column. And so we know that DB1, because I looked it up in an index, is a dimethyl polysiloxane system. See the dimensions of the column, which we already talked about, the part number, you know, that's not real relevant unless you want to order it. You'll see the oven conditions used. So in this case, what you're doing is you're going to 40C and then you're actually ramping it as a function of time, which is not an unusual thing to do. Uh, you have a carrier gas of helium. You get the flow rate. You'll notice the injector. It's a split 1 to 10. That means, of course, you might be injecting 10 microliters, but only a tenth of that's entering the mobile phase. And as you're going to hear about in the next lecture, we have an FID detector on the system. Now, a one word about the oven. The oven is actually what contains the column. So in a GC system, there are actually three different temperature regimes. There's the temperature of injection, there's the temperature of the column itself, and then there's the temperature of the detector area. Because remember, you don't want the hot gas coming off the column to go into a cold detector and then have it condense. So typically, the detector is also elevated in temperature. And so in the oven, what you often do, as you can see, at what's called an isothermal run at the top, you only get five of your molecules off the system in about 30 minutes. But you've got many more molecules there, but you just have to wait a really long time to get them off. So what you often do, rather than just increasing the temperature up to 145 to try to get everything off, because when you do that, you notice all the early peaks pile up together, you actually do a programmed run where you start slow or low, and so you get one and two off, and they're nicely separated. But as a function of time, you start increasing the temperature. And so basically, you're pulling all these long retention times to earlier retention times. And that's a really good way of getting a lot of information if you have a mixture that has, for example, really polar and really nonpolar components, rather than waiting forever for the last thing to come out. You can do a temperature ramp and really increase the temperature in the oven, which is going to increase the column temperature. And usually, it's going to diminish retention time so your overall separation is faster. That's all I wanted to tell you in this lecture about columns and the ovens that are used for these separations. Thanks so much and see you next time.